fabulous, really fabulous to be here. And thank you so much. Music is magic. I'm convinced that music has magical powers. Just consider, and now, don't get me wrong, I love and adore all the other arts and love the way in which the arts are brought together into new art forms. But think for a minute, music, in its essence, is ephemeral, it is abstract, it is not made out of words, except, except when words actually form the sound material. And it is not about visual imagery. And yet, it speaks. It speaks in remarkable ways. It engages the feeling and the thinking parts of us as human beings. It can, it can move us to tears. It can leave us dumbstruck with emotion. It can bring us to a sense of just being so joyous at being alive. And think about this. A paradox. Music is about time, okay? We have two elements. There's sound and there's time. That's it. And yet, music seems to have the capacity to bring time to a standstill. Yes, it's an illusion, but at the same time, it's a miracle. And I know that when I hear great music in committed, passionate performances, and there's so much of that happening everywhere. I'm talking about old music, about new music, right here at Ear Taxi Festival, and everywhere. When I hear music done this way, I feel as though I'm being injected with adrenaline. And if that's not magic, I don't know what is. Now, I talked about uh, uh, listening to music, about making music as a composer. Well, that's a different story. Uh, sometimes I refer to it as the agony and the ecstasy. <laughs> and there are, of course, these incredible moments of ecstasy. And that's why we do this, of course, these moments where we feel that maybe, maybe we're touching on something that is a truth. And the rest of the time, we work very, very hard to make it happen. Uh, people very often ask me, what are the sources of inspiration? Inspiration is a good word, but I think it also has the potential of being, in a sense, a uh, passive word, in a sense that you sit and you, you wait for the muse to strike. And of course, that's not how it is. You have to find, identify that which triggers the creative spark. I like to think of inspiration really as a trigger for the creative spark. And I tell people that all of life is inspiration, anything and everything. And like beauty, it is in the eye of the beholder. So it, of it is, of course, about things that somehow they can be small things and large things, but they are special to me, and those things become the triggers for the creative spark. So I'm going to tell you about uh, two works of mine composed over a very long uh, distance of time and talk a little bit about uh, some aspects of uh, how they came to be. And I'll take you first of all way back. This is the late 60s. I went into a bookstore in New York. Yes, true, I am from Israel. I'm an Israeli and I came to this country, but it was not directly to Chicago. It was actually to New York initially where I was studying. I walked into, into a bookstore and there was this book. 
this very book. And it was on the top of a stack of books that must have just arrived. And I looked at it, and it said, Nellie Sachs, or the chimneys. And I had heard of Nellie Sachs. She was the Nobel Prize winner in literature in 1966, along with the Israeli uh, writer, Sai Agnon. And I picked up this book and happened to open it right on one particular page. And I started reading right there in the store. A dead child speaks. Now, I knew that Nellie Sachs, her writing was about the Holocaust, uh, which she experienced, albeit from something of a distance, because she fled to Sweden. She was a German Jewish writer, poet. And I started to read. My mother held me by my hand, then someone raised the knife of parting so that it should not strike me my mother loosed her hand for mine. And I'm not going to read now the whole poem. And I have to say, I've read it on many occasions. But then once I had my own children, I couldn't any longer read this poem without getting very emotional. But I will go right to the end of that poem. As I was led to death, I still felt in the last moment the unsheathing of the great knife of parting. And when I read this poem, I actually found myself in a situation where I started to read it, and I read it very quickly, breathlessly, though I knew, I knew where it was heading. But it was, there was an urge. It was not one of those poems that where you can just stop and reflect and maybe re read again. And I knew that I would want to set this uh, poetry to music as a way of making my do not forget statement. And indeed, I selected five poems out of the book and created this song cycle, or the chimneys, which is uh, written for a uh, female voice, uh, flute, clarinet, cello, piano, and percussion. And this is an ensemble with which one can actually create a great deal of sound. It's like a little orchestra of sorts. When I came to the last movement, what I decided to have as the last movement, the fifth song, which is titled, Hell is Naked, I felt I needed more. And now I'm going to take you back a few years earlier. November 22, 1963. It's a day that should have been like any other day. For me, it was going to be a great day. Because on that day, I was rehearsing. I had the privilege of having my capriccio for piano and orchestra selected by Leonard Bernstein to be performed by me as pianist with the New York Philharmonic on a young people's concert. This was this incredible series of concerts that went on for a long time. Today, of course, everyone is involved and engaged in outreach activities and taking music to uh, young people and to communities and so on. But this was uh, in the 60s and went on uh, for a good while of music that would be performed and conceived for young people, uh, and it was a, a, a huge gift to, to America and to humanity to have these concerts that were televised from coast to coast. And this was the annual young performers concert that I was uh, on. A year earlier, it was Andre Watts who was on that particular concert and was, came for the first time to uh, public view. And so we went in there, and of course, for us composers, a rehearsal, a first rehearsal, is really the most exciting time. Because this is when everything that you have been hearing in your mind and working uh, ceaselessly to put on paper in notational form, this is when you actually hear it for the first time. And I'll never forget that rehearsal. Very, very exciting. 
we went out from the stage into the lobby of what is now known as the Avery Fisher Hall of uh, um, Lincoln Center. At that point, it was called the Philharmonic Hall. Lincoln Center was fairly newly built at the time. And there were people walking all over the place, and we knew there was something going on, very, very strange. And then someone said, President Kennedy was shot. And of course, we all, we started talking to each other and we were all very confused and we didn't know what was going on and you can imagine. And of course, us who were involved in the concert also didn't know, well, will there be a concert? What? In any case, I left the building with my mother and a few other people who were there and suddenly bells started to ring. Bells from everywhere. Many bells of all kinds and different rates and I knew. We knew. And so in 1969 composing All the Chimneys, when I came to that point, Hell is Naked, and was imagining that, okay, I have this large, big sounding ensemble, but I want something more. I decided that here I would create an electronic uh, tape that would be made with sirens and bells. And I know that the idea of bells was in some way something that was absorbed in me from that afternoon. So I wanted to share that experience with you. And now jumping many years ahead uh, and talking again about sources of inspiration or triggers. Uh, definitely one of the great triggers for a composer is a commission. Somebody coming to you, an artist, a, an ensemble, uh, an organization, and um, having you write a work for them. And in many cases, this comes with some type of stipulation. And uh, sometimes these stipulations can in themselves be very inspiring and open up a world of possibilities. And so in uh, 2010, a wonderful violist, uh, Washington-based Amelia Watrous, came to me with an idea. She wanted to commission a viola piece from me but she had this idea that the piece would in some way connect with an existing viola work, something from the repertory. And I love the idea of connecting with all sorts of music, and music uh, of the past is uh, so much part of me that I was very excited about the idea. And I started to go over in my mind the repertory of uh, viola music. And in fact, until... Uh, the last few decades, it's a relatively limited repertory. And I think I know some of it and went through it in my mind, but somehow that was not really what I wanted to do. Uh, and then I started to hear in my mind a certain, this is from Berio, the folk songs, the very first song, Black is the Color, and there is a beautiful viola lick there. And this just kept playing in my mind and I thought, okay, why not? I will take that as my point of departure. And this is how Perfect Storm came to be. And we have the wonderful Doyle Ambrust joining me now and uh, we're not going to be able to hear the whole piece but we will hear two fairly major excerpts out of it thank you doyle uh, and uh, the first of all the opening where i'm going to into something even simpler than that little burial lick that had so caught my mind i wanted to go to something that is almost elemental in its purity. So you will hear the opening section and then going just a tiny bit into the first phrase of the coming contrasting section. So this will be the first of two sections 
Mr. Doyle will be uh, playing for us. Talking about sources of inspiration, let me make it clear. Yes, of course, there are external sources of inspiration that a composer sometimes works with. But more than anything else, it is the material itself. It's getting into the musical material and getting deeper and deeper into its possibilities and taking it in all sorts of unexpected directions. And so here is another section in Perfect Storm. Thank you. 
and on it goes, and my time is more than up. Thank you so much.